Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, aka WWTV, aka the best wine show on the internet or just anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. This is the inaugural episode of my new show. I'm calling it episode zero. I reference my uncertainty as to whether to start with zero or one in my upcoming interview at Pedernales Cellars. Be sure to look for that next Monday. So what is WWTV? It's the evolution of Leet Wine TV, AKA 1337 Wine TV. But first, make sure that you hit the subscribe button down there, hit like if you're digging what I'm screaming here. So a couple months ago, I was casually checking on the stats of some of my fellow YouTubers that do wine. While one has been on here longer than I have, all the others have been on much less. And while envy is a sin, I was envious of some of their stats. Now let's be clear, none of us are getting rich from YouTube. Even the most successful of the group that I know of has less than 40,000 subscribers, and he's an outlier with that. The next lowest is just under 4,000 subscribers, and most everybody else is somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000. Except me. I have just over 250. WCF, mate. Not to be critical, but I know my content is at least as good, if not better, than most of the people out there. So I decided to take a hard look at what I thought were the reasons why. First, the name, 1337 Wine, really? What does that mean? I know, did you know before I had explained it to you? And even when I did, did it still make sense? No, it was originally gonna be a wine brand. Now that makes sense. A wine review show called Leet Wine makes no sense unless it's reviewing expensive wines. Not that I don't review a high-end wine from time to time, but all this started with value wines. So the name seemed like the biggest obstacle. I might get someone watching the beginning of the episode, but leave once they realize it's wine or it's a certain price point. I can tell you when I met people in person, I always had to explain the name. So a name that made sense was important, hence Wine World TV. I had another name, but quickly found out that it was taken. Next was my content. It's solid. Some of the best research out there, Presentation's decent, but I ramble. I go off script frequently. I look up stuff during the show, so preparation became something I wanted to work on. I follow several other YouTubers and they are very successful in what they do. All of them stick to some kind of script. Whether they are reading from a teleprompter like I'm doing right now, or memorizing their lines, they stick to a script and only ad limb when necessary. Next, I decided to abandon one of the things I held to be a core philosophy. No cuts. In the past, I never cut out anything. However, you've already seen me do what they're called jump cuts during this intro. I left my warts for all to see when it came to the production of Leet Wine TV, flubs, forgetting things, etc. The idea was to ensure integrity of my reviews. In other words, you are seeing my first reaction to the wine without question. Okay, so I could have had the wine prior to recording, but I can assure you I didn't. This was one of the hardest things at first, but I came up with doing this instead. Script out the pre-wine review stuff, then once I get to a wine, just freestyle. All the pre-wine review stuff was extra, so now I'll provide the info but script it out. Reviewing premium wines. Over time, I've been exposed to and had access to more expensive wines. It's normal when you make it as a psalm and work in a fine dining restaurant. As I was getting comfortable with better wines and their restaurant versus retail pricing, my retail purchases have dramatically shrunk. So I plan on being more inclusive of wines that are under $20 to $25. But wait, there's more. I'll be doing more non-wine reviews in the future. Beer, spirits, cider, maybe even a sake or two, plus gadgets and other related beverage equipment. These are my core four goals. I have plenty more, but they are less big picture stuff. Hey, let's get into some wine before I keep going. So I've already had a flub and I went through my script and opened the wine, but I haven't tasted it yet. And I didn't actually restart recording the video. Anyway, so if you've been watching my show for a while, then you'll know that I try to have some killer wines on it, today is no exception. When it comes to champagne, I thought, what champagne house needed to be highlighted? It came down to Ruinart, Gosset, 
and Bruno Payard. Not that there aren't some really cooler and killer houses out there, but I was looking for something either truly historic, iconic, or something really close to my heart. I have a special place in my heart for Bruno and Elise Payard. Bruno especially, as he spent quite a bit of time with me last year at Provine talking about his wine. That, and I also tend to get at least one free bottle every year that I'll use for my Christmas or New Year's episodes. I don't know if I'm getting one this year, but I probably will. I want to do something different though. I mentioned Ruinart and Gasset. Gasset is significant in the Champagne War for being the oldest winery in Champagne. It was founded in 1584 by Pierre Gasset. They predate sparkling wine production in Champagne. However, Ruinart is the oldest Champagne house that has exclusively produced sparkling wine. Founded by Nicholas Ruinart in 1729 in the city of Rans. It looks like Reims or Rhymes, but it's pronounced Rans or pretty close to that. It is both historic and has a special place in my heart as they are a great sponsor of Texom. Anyway, as an entrepreneur, Nicholas Runart realized the ambitions of his uncle, Dom Terry Runart, to make Runart an authentic champagne house. He was a learned Benedictine monk. He foretold the wine with bubbles from champagne was destined for a bright future. In the period immediately following the 1728 Edict of Louis XV, which authorized the transport of wine in bottles, the house was established. Prior to this edict, wine could only be transported in barrels, which made it impossible to send champagne to distant markets and confine consumption primarily to its area of production. Nicholas Ruinart founded the House of Ruinart on September 1st, 1729. The first delivery of Wine with Bubbles went out in January 1730. At first, the sparkling wine was a gift for the cloth purchasers as Don Ruinart's brother was a cloth merchant. But six years later, Maison Ruinart terminated its cloth selling activities due to the success in the champagne business. As the sparkling wine business expanded, having sellers was important. In 1768, Claude Ruinart became the first producer to purchase eight kilometers or five miles of Gallo-Roman chalk quarries, known as Creer. Uh, they're dug out under the city of Rans. They are sometimes up to 38 meters or 125 feet deep, and some are the largest in the region. The chalk helps keep the cellars at a constant 11 degrees Celsius or 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Ruinart is aged three to four years for non-vintages and nine to 10 years on average for a Dom Ruinart, which is their top bottling. It's known as a Tete de Cuvée or a Prestige Cuvée. The Carrières became a French historic monument in 1931, and today they're still used to age all of Ruinart's wines, but you won't find any of them predating 1945, but why? Ruinart's US brand director, Nicolas Ricroc, has said, during the war, the Germans found their way into the cellars and basically emptied them. That's why we do not have one single bottle from the time before 1945. Besides being the oldest champagne house, they have a distinctive bottle, as you can see. The shape of the bottle first shows up in 1735 in Jean-Francois de Troyes painting The Oyster's Lunch. It features champagne, and if you look closely, you'll see the cork suspended in midair. As far as when they started using the shape, it's unclear. It seems like they used it from the beginning. This shape was fairly common at the time for champagne wines, and Ruinart stuck with that design. It is currently owned by LVMH, which is Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. However, back in 1963, it was just Moet and Chandon. This wine is a non-vintage Blanc de Blancs. That means it's made with 100% Chardonnay grapes. 20 to 25% are reserved wines from the past two years. I purchased it at Central Mark for $79. All right. Let's get into the wine. So it might help to get a glass. As I've mentioned in prior shows when I do champagnes and or sparkling wines, it is best to really use, I'm gonna put this over here, it's easier to see. It's best to really use a larger glass. Using something like a flute you don't really get the aromas. It doesn't really concentrate the aromas quite right. It's pretty, it looks great because you get all the bubbles. You really can't see the bubbles here. Um, well, just because it's kind of hard to see anyway. But if I had it here, it'd be easier to see the bubbles. Now, I'm not gonna be spitting, but I have my spit bucket here just in case. I'm not gonna spit it. Anyway, let's get into the wine. So right off the bat, uh, I get some really good green apple, um, some really tart green apple on it. I mean, you can smell the carbonation, like you can feel the carbonation. It feels like, you know, 
all that little gas is going up, up your nose and little bubbles kind of tickling the nose a little bit. Or it could be just like the hairs on my mustache beard. No, it's, it's the bubbles. There's kind of this almost waxy crayon type of thing. And, and don't take this as a negative thing. It was just kind of remind me of crayons real quick. But there's also, um, so we'll use the term lees a lot. And there's this bread, not bread, but bready quality. Um, so it's kind of like this waxy bread type of quality to it. And that's going to be your lees aging. So it does this thing to wine where it kind of, Gives you uh, kind of a toasty, not toasty from barrels, but kind of this toasty brioche type of, of uh, aromas. It also can come across as like pasta water to me. Also come across as stale beer, not in this case um, because it's bubbly. But all those are similar things you'll get from Lee's Aging. It's got this... Also, also kind of like this confectionery sugar, like it's like a, a pastry with sugar on it. This is not going to be a sweet, by, sweet wine by any means, but it's kind of like that almost powdered sugar confectionery type of thing on, on like a pastry. No, not that kind of pastry. Never mind. I was thinking about something else, but it doesn't really have a lot of really sugar on it very often. But yeah, I mean, it's really like this tart green apple. You get the lazy quality. Um, you know, a lot of times in champagne, you don't get a ton of aromas. It's really all about the mouthfeel and, and, and the palate itself. But yeah, let's just taste it. So this is where really champagne for me in general, and sparkling wine a lot, really comes to be something I really like. It's the palate. So yes, it's the green apple, but there's a little more juiciness to it. It's almost like a almost like a um, one of those hard candy green apple things, right? It's kind of a sweet tart type of thing. It's not sweet by any means, but you get the condition of fruit. You get like a fruity quality to it. And you also get this tartness to it. A little green apple skin. I also get a little touch of peach to it. A little bit of melon. I also get a little bit of caramel. Almost like a caramelized green apple. In addition to that, that pastry, it's like a flaky pastry. Not really with the powdered sugar, the confectionery really on the palate but there's like this flaky pastry type of thing. Not quite like a croissant or croissant. It's not really like a croissant, but maybe a little bit. Um, especially if it was like maybe warmed up and it, it kind of has that really good mouthfeel to it. Kind of flaky, really light, airy, but not buttery. There's no butter on this and there shouldn't be. It's, it's absolutely delicious. Now, yes, have I had this before? Yeah, I had it, let's see, it's October 2nd, right? Well, technically it's October 3rd now. And the last time I had Rune Art was back in February. No, I'm sorry, back in March in, in Oregon. Is it the exact same wine? Probably, but it's non-vintage wine and it's Rune Art and I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna really enjoy my episode here. So I kind of gave you the rundown of what the wine tastes like and if you can afford $79, 80, 70, 90, whatever it's gonna cost, you should buy it because it is absolutely delicious wine. Okay, so now that I've kind of talked about the wine and absolutely you should buy this wine, let's continue. All right, so now that I've covered the reasoning for the rebrand and some of the, my general changes, let's get into more uh, specifics. First, what's gonna be different? I mean, yeah, I could change the name, but really, is that gonna be it? It's a valid point. If you've watched the last three to four Leet Wine episodes, then you've already seen some of the changes. The teleprompter, uh, Google Earth, etc. cetera. Uh, in this episode, you've seen some of those visual changes that didn't happen at the end of Leet Wine. Let's talk color scheme. So I decided on some basic colors to stick with. My primary colors are burgundy and its variations, champagne as variations, 
And the most basic, it's red and white wine. In addition to that, I use black and white as secondary and tertiary colors. I did one more to the website. So a salmon hued rosé, that was more for legibility on the website as the official red colors were really hard to read. I didn't want to use white for my text as I felt it was a little too harsh. Champagne for the headlines, but rosé for the body text. That extends to the set somewhat. I switched to a black tablecloth as I felt the red was very domineering. It looked good, but it was really bright. I've kept the spit bucket for now. Uh, I removed a 1337 wine sticker, though you might still see some of the residue. I think I got it all off though. The background is difficult to retire. The Chateau Petit Pouch barrel room, it was founded in 1337. I actually visited it in 2011. I can tell you that I still haven't decided exactly what I'm using as I write this script on 10.1, but most likely it will be my dual wine glass banner, at least for now. You'll also see the WWTV logo on the video. For my reviews, I have a rotating turntable in order to take a 360 video of the wine bottles, which you've already seen, and anything else. Those are the major changes. I'm sure I'll make some tweaks down the line. Uh, number two, the schedule. My traditional day to release reviews is Monday at midnight central time. I'll continue to release some reviews on Monday. I'm calling it Main Monday. I'm also going to go back to putting out a second show each week. However, instead of it being Thursday, it'll be on Friday, known as Freestyle Friday. This gives me the flexibility to produce anything I want. For instance, this Friday is a Life with Mark style show. I recorded my food and beverage pairing for my birthday dinner at home back on September 8th. It includes me making a pre-dinner cocktail and the wines and other beverages for each course. This is a typical doing it right dinner with me. The Friday shows will focus on something like this or doing education, non-wine reviews, interviews, Skype or in person, but also more reviews if I have a lot to put out or put out a show based on something last minute. If all goes well, I'll also do a weekly wine news show. I'll call it Weekly Wine News or WWN. Q James Earl Jones. This is CNN. I get a few daily and weekly newsletters. I also get several press releases a week. The Leet Wine format didn't really allow me to include that content. The new format will. As far as when I'll start that, I don't know. Right now is very timely with all the fires going on, especially the glass fire in Napa. I just need to work that kind of show into my workflow. It would need to be recorded sometime Sunday through Tuesday to be ready by Wednesday and still be timely. I can also use Friday as a breaking news show. So specials, I'll still do my end of the year holiday specials and other special event shows. And pretty much I'll just stick to that. If some other holiday or special event comes along, then I can possibly have a show about them. But for now, I don't plan on changing how I do my Halloween special. I'll keep the same song, uh, the same intro, be the Grim Reaper, make sure Horatio's around, etc. I've already mentioned the website. It's a brand new look besides the color schemes. All my social media accounts have been converted to Wine Roll TV. However, Twitter somehow decided to spend my account. I have absolutely no idea why. I don't post anything remotely against their policies on that account or really any other one that I have at this point. I've filed an appeal and I'm awaiting their reply. Anyway, everything else that I have is under the new name. Pretty much all that was done weeks ago. When it comes to interviews, pretty much anything outside of Texas is not happening in person least for a while. However, with this pandemic, everyone has had to figure out how to do virtual stuff. So I hope to do more Skype interviews and virtual tastings with wineries. The rest, not much else on my radar other than maybe doing some live streams, creating a merchandise line. I haven't seriously thought too much about the other things. So that's it. WWTV, the new brand. I have big and epic plans for this show. Hope to leverage my 11 years of experience doing Elite Wine TV and improve upon it. As my intro said, I intend this to be the best show about wine anywhere. If you like this episode and want to see more, then hit that subscribe button, click like too, and tell your friends about the show. Until next time, salute.